Hi, this is Dr. Tony Cooper, and this is Life Without Baggage. In this podcast, I'll help you develop a stronger sense of self, develop firmer boundaries, and also learn how to lean into the gentle promptings of the Holy Spirit who can help you navigate life. I have dozens of bonus videos posted that will help you in these areas and also will help you develop stronger coping skills. In each of the program notes, there's a link where you can find my other media and also where you can find my books on Amazon. Just a reminder before we get into today's episode that this is not a substitute for medication or counseling. If you're having thoughts of harming yourself or another person, or if this material triggers you, please contact your doctor or a mental health specialist to help you with your concerns. Now here's today's episode. I like to regularly address concerns related to trauma since so many people have trauma in their background. So today I'm interviewing an expert in the field of trauma. We're going to be talking about the physical effects on the body and the brain, the negative coping strategies that people might have gotten involved in, some strategies of how to cope differently, and some spiritual principles that can help us move through trauma as a person of faith. So I hope you'll enjoy this episode. So I have a guest today in this week's episode of Life Without Baggage. My guest is Jenny L. Taylor. Welcome today. Thank you so much for having me. Let me uh, read your bio for my listeners. You have a very impressive bio. So Jenny L. is a psychotherapist, life coach, certified clinical trauma specialist, and the founder of Shades of Trauma Healing. She's passionate about helping adults heal from the impacts of childhood trauma so they can fully live out their purpose. As a coach, Jenny L. utilizes talk therapy, spiritual applications, and somatic, which means body awareness interventions, to help clients understand how their trauma impacts them or keeps them stuck and enabled to move forward. Jenny L. embraces joy, playfulness, and laughter in her personal and professional life and encourage her friends and clients to do the same. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) And if you've listened to her podcast, she's very gentle, very soothing, but super informative. I find that a lot of uh, Christian podcasts, Jenny L, maybe you've noticed, not a lot of fluff, not a lot of content. Mm. And uh, you have plenty of good content and suggestions and strategies. So I'm eager to hear what you're going to share with us. You're, um, one of your specialties is more focusing, like we read, on the brain. And I don't talk that much about the uh, physiology of trauma and what it does in the brain and the body. So first of all, could you define for, for us What is trauma? Thank you. I'm glad you asked that because I may have a slightly different perspective, not based on what trauma actually is, but based on how it is defined. A lot of the audience may hear of big T trauma, little t trauma, meaning the event that happened was something really drastic, for example, sexual abuse or domestic violence versus little t trauma, which may or be someone shouting at you. I tend to not define trauma based on the event that happened. And there's a lot of research supporting this as well. Trauma is not so much what happened to you, but how you experience what happened to you. And to help with that, if anyone goes through an experience where fear is coupled with helplessness, that is the foundation of a trauma. So you may have a family where they go through the same experiences, the children experience, maybe the dad shouting, yelling, but they come away with a different experience based on how they internalized it, how they felt. And it may be trauma, traumatic for one person, but the other person 
it is not as traumatic or the impact is not as great. That's a good distinction. Uh, the word trauma gets thrown around quite a bit these days. Yes. And uh, something can be really uh, critical and life-changing, but the level of trauma that we're talking about is, um, it affects how you function. Exactly. So do you want to uh, explain a little bit more about how trauma impacts people, uh, why maybe it affects people differently and what it does in the brain? Sure. So it all depends on personality. It, it's such a, a wide array of reasons why people get affected differently. It can start with things like intergenerational trauma. What has my parents passed on to me? We know about epigenetics, where trauma actually changes the way your brain functions. It affects your DNA, and that is passed on to children as well. So depending so on what Mm -hmm. Why don't you explain that? I have never explained that. And this might be a new concept for people. Okay, for sure. So an example I would give, and I will talk about it more particularly because I tend to focus on this a lot with my clients. There is a part of the brain that's called the anterior cingulate of the cortex. And we call that the ACC for short. Mm -hmm. And if you are experiencing trauma, the ACC is meant to act as sort of your radar system to tell what is relevant to you. If someone grew up in an environment where someone constantly shouted at them or they were neglected emotionally, they were physically abused, that part of the brain, the ACC, begins to zone in on those experiences because that is what is most relevant to you to keep you safe. If someone comes along and tells you, you're such a lovely child, I enjoy spending time with you, that goes right over their head because that is not relevant for their safety. So whatever that ACC begins to notice as a threat to the person is what is going to inform the way they begin to think, what they hear. What other changes are common in the brain? Other changes include the inability to see the positive things, because again, you're just focused on what is a threat to you. You have, when someone is triggered, you have the chemicals being released in the brain, whether it's dopamine, there's GABA, there's adrenaline. The brain naturally releases these things more frequently and quicker than someone who has not gone through trauma because the body and the brain's full function is to keep you safe. So it has been trained over time based on the experiences that whenever I hear, see, smell, taste, or touch something that reminds me of the trauma, the only or the immediate response is to release these chemicals, release these uh, hormones, in the system to get you ready for fight, freeze, fawn, or flee. And when that happens, it actually shuts down or depresses the executive functioning, the frontal part of the brain. So you can't really think clearly in that moment. And it takes a while for those chemicals and those hormones to move through the body. So this is where I say to clients, it is important to notice when you are first triggered because by the time you get to the point where the chemicals and the hormones are released, oftentimes it's too late to think your way out of what is happening. And by think your way out, I mean thinking clearly enough to know I'm going to apply this intervention or I'm going to take myself away from this situation. By that time, the system is already, I like to say, jacked up. And you really just need to give it the space it needs to calm down and have the chemicals released from the, the bloodstream before you're able to think back. You know, a lot of these terms get thrown around um, in, in common language. But if you're truly triggered, then mm -hmm. your ability to think and to be rational gets hijacked. And then the yes. other parts of the brain, like you said, the freeze, uh, fight, flight, fawn. Did I miss one? 
um, that that those those take over. And yes. so we want to take responsibility for how we handle things. But we need to understand if you are truly triggered, you don't have control over that because your nervous system, your survival mechanisms take yes. over. And so it may take a while before you calm down enough to think about, wow, you know, what just happened? Yes. Exactly. And that is so freeing for a lot of clients, because a lot of people, because many people do feel, why can I have a better control over my anger? Or why do I keep getting these panic attacks? And once we explain, just as you said, that, yes, we are responsible, but there is a big timing element involved. And our job is to help you learn to track your nervous system. So you recognize when there is a shift in your system that indicates the first sign that a trigger or a trauma response is being activated so you can take an intervention, do an intervention at that point. But if you should miss that window, don't beat yourself up. Be compassionate with yourself and know that you're literally dealing with biology here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the tools that you teach people, Jenny L? The first step is always, we call it bottom up treatment, meaning we start with the body as opposed to starting with the thoughts. The first step is always nervous system regulation. Mm -hmm. Whenever I, and I see clients, I get a, a history of who they are. I understand what their challenges are. And we always start with helping them doing by doing a body scan to get them more attuned to their bodies because a lot of people, they, they operate on the cognitive realm until the cognitive realm gets shut down. But mm -hmm. they're, not, they're not really attuned to what's happening in their body. So first thing first is always, and this is part of safety and stabilization. When we talk about trauma, we never, ever, ever want to discuss trauma, have people talk about memories or experiences if they are not in a regulated or a safe body. So first things first, we teach you body regulating skills. A lot of times we do a lot of breathing exercises because breathing is one of the ways that the brain understands its safe. If we think of when we are afraid, we tend to hold our breath. Mm -hmm. And on any given day, you would notice people breathe very shallow breath. The breath doesn't actually go down to the diaphragm and come back out. So deep breathing is one exercise we do. There are also nervous system regulating exercises. There's one, it has a funny name. It's called a wet noodle. No, <laughs> I don't know that one. <laughs> essentially, the process is having you scan your body and notice where you hold tension mm -hmm. or any restriction. For most people, it's the shoulders or the neck. And then you relax every single muscle in your body while breathing deeply in through the nose and exhaling a long, slow breath out through the mouth. And with every exhale, you just feel your body sink deeper and letting gravity do its job. The aim of it is to have your body feel like jelly or jello because that relaxes the nervous system. The breathing indicates to the brain, I'm safe because if I wasn't safe, I wouldn't be breathing this slowly and deliberately. And then having the body relax just allows the nervous system to calm down. The brain gets to see that, okay, I'm safe. Mm -hmm. I don't have to keep looking for threats in the environment. I can relax. So that's the first step. A lot of these techniques, you can find little YouTube videos that teach you how to do it. Tapping yes. is really popular here in America. So this is where if your body relaxes and you feel yes. safe, then you can start thinking, then you can implement some of these other cognitive strategies. But yes. when there has truly been trauma, when your physical systems have been changed, yes. then it becomes important for people to learn how to, like you said, regulate. And, you know, one of the things I find a lot, and I'm curious if you see the same thing, is people who are Christians many times do just live in their brain. 
they are mm. pretty disconnected from their bodies. I totally agree. I do find that a lot, which is probably why I'm so passionate about somatic work, because mm. somewhere along the line, the message came through that anything to do with the body is not Christian. And there's nothing that's further from the truth because we are created body, spirit, mind. And we do have to look just the same way we have physical doctors to take care of a broken knee, a broken foot or a broken arm. We do have a nervous system. It's part of our function. So it makes sense to me that we also look at the nervous system so people can begin experiencing holistic healing, not mm -hmm. just praying things away. Exactly. God created us with the body. It needs mm -hmm. sleep, it needs food, yeah. and, it, and it needs to be at peace. So uh, are there other things that you teach people to get the physical uh, systems regulated, calmer uh, strategies to interrupt some of these hijacks? Yes. The other important thing as part of learning to do the body work or the somatic work, first, if someone is trying to do these exercises, because you mentioned you can go on YouTube, you can learn. These are great. And depending on the person, you need what is called co-regulation, which is doing these exercises in the presence of a safe other, someone mm -hmm. with a regulated nervous system. Because a lot of trauma gets formed because of that feeling of helplessness and fear while being alone. So for mm -hmm. a lot of people who experience trauma, asking them to do anything in isolation or by themselves is triggering in itself. Mm -hmm. So having a therapist or even a lot of people co-regulate with their pets because pets also yeah. have a nervous system mm -hmm. and the nervous system is calm. It's not activating and nervous systems react to nervous systems. Because I, I don't know if you've ever been in a space, in a crowd where you go around someone and the person's energy, it just you just begin to feel uneasy. You can't put words to it. You don't know. You just know something shifted. That is nervous system energy playing against nervous system energy. So co-regulation is another key part of having that safety or doing those exercises to promote safety in the nervous system. Yeah. Yeah. If you think about it in an ideal environment, when something scary happens when we're little, we kind of tuck ourselves under, you know, the arm of mom or dad, yes. someone who can soothe us. And so that's the ideal of how this happens. Mm -hmm. But if mom or dad aren't, aren't safe or aren't with us when the trauma occurs, then we get dysregulated, don't we? Yes, absolutely. Then the challenge becomes, how do we help that inner child, The meaning the emotional part of you learn that it is okay to now trust someone to help you as you work on the traumatic memory. What other suggestions do you have for people that are learning how to um, take care of themselves, recognizing that they've been through something traumatic and that they, they want to be healthier. They want to be more balanced. What is immediately coming to mind for me, because I see it all the time, is an encouragement that trauma healing takes time. Mm -hmm. Your trauma was not developed overnight. It is going to take time. And while you go through the process, Lots of, lots of self-compassion is needed. And a lot of people have to learn how to be compassionate towards themselves because it was never modeled for them. And that's okay. Do not be so hard on yourself if you don't know how to take care of yourself. Look at it as an opportunity to learn how to self-care. And once you do, consistency is key. Set up daily routines, something that you enjoy, something that brings you peace and calm to Christians. It could be meditation, prayer, reading scripture, going for a walk in nature. Anything that engages the five senses in a calming way 
should be incorporated as part of your staff care routine consistently so that you can now train the body and the brain that there is a different way that I can exist in this world. I don't have to always feel fearful or on guard about what is happening or what could be a threat to me in the environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I find that a lot of people who have had a history of trauma, they don't really protect themselves from chaos. They sort of live in it. And sometimes we have to recognize that it's okay to take charge of where I go, who I let in my house, who I let in my car, who I give money to, that to begin to take control of the things in a healthy way that I can control so that I'm not repeatedly re-traumatized. Yes. And that takes a lot of learning. As for most people who've been through trauma, those type of environments are so familiar. They may not be comfortable, but they're familiar. And people don't know how to exist in an environment other than this. So we, in our role, get to teach people how mm -hmm. to do that, which is beautiful. And it starts with you believing that you deserve to be in a different environment. That what happened to you is not the only way. There is a different way to be. There are different experiences that you can have. And you get to learn how to accept and live with the expectation that that is possible for you. What are the other things that you find commonly survivors of trauma get stuck in? Unhealthy coping strategies. What are the ones you see a lot? I... Because I deal with a lot of Christian women, I want to talk about this one, but even doing church work tends to be a coping mechanism because a lot of people feel so inadequate and they grew up in homes that did not have conditional, unconditional love. So they learned that they had to perform or to do things, to earn love, to be seen, to be respected. And they grow up with this idea Perhaps they go to church and they realize that, or, or not realize, but they've had the message that I need to perform in order to be accepted. And they carry that schema into their church life because our parents gives us an indication of who God is based mm -hmm. on how they treated us. So they see God as a God who would not love them unconditionally. So you find people going through burnout, giving up themselves, giving what they do not even have all in an effort to try to feel loved, to feel secure, to feel accepted. So I work a lot with clients to reverse that, to say, yes, Jesus first, but you can't give what you don't have. So you mm -hmm. need to let Jesus pour into you so that you can then pour into others. So self-care, again, it comes back to self-care. And that is one coping mechanism. And I deal with a lot of women, emotional eating, is a big thing where women have not learned to live with the emotions because they're so uncomfortable, they're so yucky. And the brain tells you if you feel those emotions, you're going to be in danger. So it's easier to self-soothe so that you don't feel those emotions. But with working with clients, I, I because I'm another human being with a regulated nervous system in the moment, I sit with them and allow them to feel the emotions in small doses as much as they can handle and rec recognize that, oh, I felt that shame or I felt that anger, I felt that hurt, and I'm okay. So that once you begin to feel the emotions, you no longer have to use the coping mechanism. And I know this is a lot more nuanced than what I'm saying. It's not as simple as this. But a big part of it is learning to sit with the emotions rather than feeding it or using substances or doing tasks to not feel it. People of faith feel guilty if they do drugs or alcohol. So mm. they get more stuck in these things like, well, I'm going to take care of other people till I'm at yes. the point of exhaustion or I'm yes. going to eat. Uh, Christian gatherings have lots of food, mostly <laughs> junk food that, you know, it's like, yeah, that's not necessarily healthy. So right. um, yeah, th there's still this idea that I can't tolerate these emotions. 
And so I'm going to be so busy, I don't feel. And if I'm mm-hmm. going to be home by myself, I'm going to eat so I don't feel. But it, 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 like you said, it's the process you described beautifully. It's just that it, it takes some time to get used yeah. to it, to think differently. But that's, that's how we become whole. That yes. God designed all of us our hearts, our minds, our bodies to be alive, that nothing be shut off. And again, it's learning to get to that space of sitting with a little discomfort and expanding the window of tolerance until you feel life fully. I haven't always been one, you read in my bio, who uh, embraces joy and play. I've not always been like that. I didn't always feel my emotions, but by doing inner child work, and for those who don't know, inner child work is simply allowing your emotional self to come forth, essentially feel your feelings in a safe environment. And once I began to do that, Mm -hmm. there was such freedom in the ability to feel joy in addition to all of the other feelings that came out of my trauma history. So now I'm able to sit better. It's not a hundred percent of the time, there are moments I would catch myself reverting to watching TV or eating something. And I would have to then retrace what steps did I miss? How was I not in tune with my body or my emotions that I got here? And then take corrective steps so that the next time I have a better outcome. So we have a few minutes left. What other comments would you make about um People really struggle with a very harsh view of God when they've been through trauma. Mm -hmm. What what are some things you do with people to help soften that harsh view of God? And I'll take it twofold. So for a lot of people, the trauma is so bad that the idea of God is just, yeah, it's just what it is. So for those people, finding someone who can demonstrate the true characteristics of God would be the first step. Uh, In my trauma healing journey, I had a prayer partner who really exemplified godliness to me. And it was kind of my first glimpse of what God could look like with skin on. And Mm -hmm. that was enough for me to be curious about, okay, why is she like this? Where does she get that characteristic from? And Mm -hmm. that led me into searching more to find out about who God is. And by the way, Getting to know who God really is, is a beautiful journey and it's a lifelong journey. <laughs> so oh, yeah. You oh, get yeah. to learn about him piece by piece, piece by piece. And for others who may have a little bit more of an understanding would be go to the word and pray. Another thing that I did actually is with my prayer partner, I we spent 40 days in prayer and fasting, not 24 hours a day, but every morning we would meet, pray, fast from whatever we chose to fast from and the prayer was for the indwelling of the holy spirit Mm -hmm. because the holy spirit brings alive the character of christ and the understanding of who god is to us so praying for the holy spirit to reveal the exterior and help you to experience who jesus is is another way that you can do it on your own i've used both methods and they've both worked for me So I can encourage clients or people listening to try whichever feels most appropriate for you right now. And I can say it is totally worth getting to know God as he is. He is able to heal whatever that thing is that you think no one would understand or that would be with you forever. That's not true. He is able to redeem anything situation that you've been through he's able to heal and he can restore and put you on a path even better than what you've been on before he does not erase your past but he has this beautiful way of molding and weaving his grace into your life to allow you to even use your experiences of the past without the emotional damage or charge to be a blessing to others while fully enjoying life abundantly. Yeah. That becomes your testimony. Yes. Yes, absolutely. You've given us a lot to think about. You've shared a lot of information that I don't typically 
go into. You've given us really deep understanding more of how the body is affected. How can people learn more about you or listen to your podcast? Okay, so my podcast is called the Shades of Trauma Healing Podcast. And it is on all the major platforms, Apple, Spotify, Google. And you can reach out to me via email if you have any questions, if you have any concerns or want to know more. And my email address is support at Shades of Trauma Healing Podcast.com. And I will put a link to your podcast so people can check it out. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you for taking your time and explaining these things to us. Clearly, you've done a tremendous amount of study on brain physiology, which I don't find to be as interesting. <laughs> but <laughs> it's, <okay. laughs> imp it's important, isn't it? It's mm -hmm. really important to understand because that's one of the ways people get stuck. Yes. Yes, I agree. Well, blessings on you and on your work. And what city are you in? You're in Canada, aren't you? Yes, I'm in Alberta, Canada, which is the western side. It's interesting because in different parts of the United States and even different parts of North America, the emphasis on how things are treated or the uh, techniques or strategies vary just a little bit. So I always enjoy okay. learning from other people, like what is their emphasis to handle some of these things? Well, thank you so much. Blessings. And thank you to those of you who listened today to the podcast. If this helped you, share it with a friend.